Hi, I'm Debbie Goodman, and this is Get Healthy, Be Happy, or Dr. Diego and Debbie. I'm here at uh, Allende Center of Regenerative Medicine and Vitality, and we are in the cosmetic room. Dr. Allende, what sort of procedures or services do you perform in this room? A lot of different procedures in this room. So we can start with a few. As you can see, we have our table there that we do our that we uh, sit our seat our patients in, and we can get them in a comfortable position. But this is our starting point. Uh, we can do various small procedures here, from maybe removal of a uh, skin lesion, or we can do a procedure with the laser that we have behind you. That is an erbium pixel laser. So um, that's an ablative laser. So it what it does is that it does damage to the epidermis and therefore causes basically sloughing off of the epidermis layers and gives root for the dermis to release all the other young cells to come up and repopulate the epidermis. So it basically um, it gives you a whole new set of brand new tissue on the surface of your skin and uh, it's younger tissue, there's more collagen and elastin stimulated so it provides basically an overall more youthful appearance. In addition to that, that laser also does some other treatments. It does some anti-aging treatments with a uh, pigmentation treatment, so reduce dark skin pigment marks in your skin. It also does a hair removal uh, system too. Um, in addition to that, I think that uh, that particular model also does um, another ablative type of treatment, but it just depends on what the goal of their treatment is for that day. But ultimately, it's used to regenerate and stimulate new tissue growth. How often should we continue on a program of having something done such as a face peel? I think that always depends on the goal of the treatment. And what you decide with your doctor what the, what the end of that treatment may be. Ultimately, that treatment was probably going to be an end range probably with, it probably has a lifespan of probably up to a year. And then you got to repeat treatments anyway. Sure. But you probably don't want to do an aggressive treatment all up front the beginning because it's, it's so traumatic to the tissue. You probably want to do small increments of doing treatments on a regular basis so you get slow improvements so there minimizes the downtime you're going to see. Ultimately, also probably minimizes how you know uncomfortable you feel or any if there's any discomfort associated with the treatment or just associated. Uh, byproducts of the treatment like slothing of skin or peeling. Mm -hmm. Then you may have a you know a lapse of treatment maybe eight to twelve months depending okay. how really good the treatment is. It's all about maintenance right? Mm -hmm. Anything you're gonna do in your life is about maintaining right? So ultimately we're fighting father time. Or, so we're always gonna have to be thinking about what we're gonna do next. And so I think that if we can get a great treatment and it lasts you solid for eight to twelve months you're doing fantastic. I've got, I call them devil horns right here, or worry, you know, frown lines. Uh, do you do fillers or Botox, or what do you do for something like this? I think probably the most important thing about understanding the treatment like this is that when you approach somebody, you understand it's just not going to be a one-shot deal. This is probably a pattern of taking small steps to get to the ultimate goal. First of all, you got to get new skin. You got to stimulate the collagen, you got to stimulate the elastin, you got to slough off the old dead skin. So I think the first thing you do is yes, you probably ablate it or you could do a plasma lift that we've spoken about before mm -hmm. where we get your platelets, we get the growth factors and re-inject them. And so I think that is the number one thing to get tightening and slothing off. And then the next Ooh. approach is to go ahead and start blocking the action of the muscles that perpetuate the fine lines and wrinkle lines. Okay. And depending how much product you use, you can either really paralyze or just soften the appearance. Mm -hmm. okay. Now most people say, I don't want to look like a doll. I, right. wanna, I want to be able to have some movement. So in those cases, you can control that response by how much product you put in somebody. Oh, so it's always okay. good to convey what you would like and do you want to get full block or do you want to get a softening appearance? And then, maybe a month later, once we see the muscles are paralyzed and the skin starts to tighten because you don't start, you don't, first of all, you've had the laser treatment, say, or the plasma, so the skin is tightening. And then you have a, a paralyzing agent put in place, and that gives it such 
effect that you cannot perpetuate the lines and therefore in about a month later you can really see if you have really fine lines still there or not or how deep they are because if you do it you cannot do it at one time you don't know what you're doing <laughs> and so I think it's just wasting money and at the same time over treating okay. so I think you do one and then you so you do a laser and then maybe uh, 10 to 14 days later then you put your Botox in or your Juveo or your Dysport or whatever product you're going to use and then maybe about three to four weeks later you put your um, your filler in to fill in the fine lines and you will see a gradual change in the appearance over time so there's there's a method to the madness a lot of a lot of patients do have this idea they're going to come in with a magic bullet and you know I got fine lines can you put Botox in there <laughs> well that's not how Botox works <laughs> so it's a it's a process yeah it's a, it's a roundabout treatment so we paralyze the muscle so it doesn't perpetuate the lines and then we see what we have maybe several weeks later and then and then we fill it a little bit and so we can see what it's going to look like. Uh, so you also mentioned one time something about a serum that you had and maybe use that in lieu of... So, well, nutrition is a huge part of my practice mm -hmm. and I use nutrition and even some some other products are not necessarily nutrition but do play a role in the health of our skin and tissues and so we do um, have a serum that we offer in our office and it's a nitric oxide producing serum okay. so it's basically two different types of liquids you mix them together and the byproduct that is produced is nitric oxide and nitric oxide is basically a very strong antioxidant but it helps also promote blood flow mm -hmm. antioxidants help support your immune function, but they also help support DNA so it doesn't get damaged. So it can help repair it, provide blood supply to it so it can repair itself because we have enzymes in our body that help heal our damaged DNA. And if you can heal it, then the cell doesn't die or you don't have uh, the cell become what we call senescent, which is non-functional, or even maybe a, um, a toxic cell that releases bad, in, bad products around it so it basically damages all the other cells around it too. Hmm. So you want to prevent that. Or you, want to, or you want to make your body basically destroy those cells and consume them so they're not causing damage. So nitric oxide is a great product because it helps promote blood supply and antioxidant. And if you've got a product you can put on your skin on a regular basis, it can help protect your skin against the damage of aging. Because as we sit in this room, the UVA and UVB lights still come through that wall from the sun. Maybe some of it's blocked wow. off, but they still come through that wall. And those rays contribute to aging, wrinkling, and they also contribute, contribute to the risk of increasing uh, development of cancer. And so you want to protect against those and you want to be able to heal and repair against those. So the serum is a great product and it provides that there's only one product in the market and it's patented. And so I think it's a wonderful product. We use it every day. Lots of the patients love it and enjoy it. So I think that's a must have. But I'm a big you know, person of taking internal stuff, mm -hmm. okay, and let it come out of you because we are what we put in our body, right? So you can take supplements that help increase nitric oxide production, like for instance, you can take uh, L-citrulline or L-arginine. So these are byproducts that create nitric oxide in, uh, directly, so you can have more of this nitric oxide made in your blood, which is great for lowering blood pressure too. All right, because it causes dilation of your arteries and vessels and capillary beds. That's how it increases blood flow. The internalization is probably better than just putting it on your skin, mm -hmm. but both is probably better. So I like that stuff. I also like glutathione because glutathione, again, is an antioxidant that your liver basically makes and uses to detoxify stuff. Mm. It also helps okay. keep your blood thin. She has a less likelihood of causing coagulation that you don't want, like mm -hmm. strokes and heart attacks. So, and glutathione, again, is an antioxidant helps promote blood supply, but it helps detoxify more than anything and neutralizes, key term, neutralizes reactive oxygen species or toxic oxygen metabolite particles because this is what causes damage to our DNA. Hmm. It causes ultimately disruption of things like blood supply. So we want to neutralize that and glutathione gives you the ability to neutralize that, believe it or not. So there's a lot of stuff, but if you had to pick your bullets, you know, I think nitric, nitric oxide producing products is fantastic, uh, serums and oral. I think that glutathione, um, uh, oral and topical, if you got it, you got to take it. Or a precursor to glutathione called N-acetylcysteine, same thing, just helps you make glutathione. 
and your liver uses that to detoxify stuff. So mm. you need to have those in your repertoire to keep you young, and you need to have vitamin D3. And I think that any vitamins are good because I think that when you're an active person and you exercise regularly, you have an active lifestyle, you're very busy, I'm sure you probably drink a little coffee or something, and that will help deplete you of all your vitamins. Oh. And so most of our vitamins are water-soluble, so you're going to wind up diuresing or getting them out of your body very quickly. So you should be dosing probably most of your vitamins twice a day, except probably oh. the fat-soluble ones. And when we talk about fat-soluble vitamins, we talk about vitamin A, D, E, K. Uh, but most of the other ones, you probably need to repeat on a, reg on a regular basis a couple times a day, especially if you're more active. I mean, you've seen, the, you've seen the super healthy, just amazing athlete looking person and say they're in their mid to late 40s, they're like a triathlete and all that stuff, and they look like they're as healthy as you could possibly, and then they drop dead. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And people say, I just don't know how. Must have been genetic. Must have been something else going on. Actually, I think if you could probably go back and look at them and you probably did an evaluation of their blood and stuff like that, I think you would probably see they were probably very deficient on mm. antioxidant loads and they probably were in a high oxidative state because they over metabolized. So over metabolization is bad for us too. Again, doing not doing enough is bad for us, but there is a sweet spot for all of us. And if you're going to be overly active, you're going to have to take the supplements to make up so your body can regenerate, recover, and heal and prevent disease. You want to be around as long as you can, but you want to be around as long as you can as long as the quality of life is good and you're enjoying every day. You know, and you're able to get around and move around. You're not suffering, right? I have a friend. She was our neighbor for years. So I've known her since I was five years old. Uh, she's 94. Mm -hmm. uh, she's probably the most active person in her it's an assisted living community, but she's on like the top level because she really doesn't need assistance because she's at the gym every day. They have a little gym there. Mm -hmm. She can still do the splits. Wow. <laughs> Most of my friends of any age go, I could never do the splits. She'll go, oh yeah, here, let me show you the splits. <laughs> she rides her stationary bike every day. Older girl, she's actually watched our show and, mm -hmm. and she's very interested in meeting you and coming in to see you. It would be my pleasure. It, it really would. She, yeah. she is a sweetheart. She's a sweetheart. Let's talk a little bit about nutrition. What are some of the foods that we can eat that... Uh, help prevent aging now. Everything is different for everybody. Your care should be individualized. Mm -hmm. And good nutrition is good medicine. Okay? And so I think that that depends on the analysis of your blood and your nutritional status because we can do those nutritional status evaluations and see what you're missing. So we should gear our treatment based upon your deficiencies. But as a whole in general, if people were to ask you, what should I eat, doc? Or what are you eating? Well, I eat as much vegetables that are organically grown as much as I can, okay? Quality vegetables. Um, I try to avoid a lot of fruit. I eat very little, and most of it's berries, because they're targeted. Mm -hmm. High amount of anthocyanidines, you get tons of antioxidants. The more colorful, the better. You get a lot of different stuff, and change them up. So, uh, very little fruit, tons of different colored vegetables. I minimally cook them, so like almost al dente. Mm -hmm. because you're steaming away all the nutrition products right. in them. And I stay as far away as I can from any microwave on earth because yeah. it, that's poison. Yeah. It destroys all the nutrition, plus you're being ex overexposed to electromagnetic frequencies, which we don't need. The only mm -hmm. one you need is the one from the earth. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I try to emphasize that. I'm really into alkaline water because I want my body to be in an alkaline position because that is a better promoter of healthy living. It decreases acidity in your blood, which promotes things like cancer and inflammation and aging. So you want to be more alkaline. Okay, can you pick that up at like at Trader Joe's or the, any grocery store? So or? you can buy alkaline water, or you can just get a lemon and squeeze it in your water. Oh, well, okay, I do that, so I'm good. You know, some of, some people will choose to get a machine or a, a water purifying system that has a alkaline system. Oh. And so um, I have, have one of those in-house, but that doesn't mean I don't eat lots of fruits and uh, vegetables rather than more than fruit, because I think that um, you should have that too. But having alkaline water makes a huge difference. People's energy level and everything. Yeah. So I, I think a very alkaline diet, 
a very low inflammatory diet, and I know you like cheeseburgers, and I know, and the cheese is never good for us. Okay. So dairy is not our friend as humans because we're not cows, and think people forget that. And I'm not trying to offend the dairy farmers because I love you guys and gals, but it's you know it's just not the greatest thing for humans. But at the same time, um, you gotta live a little, so you live a little bit, okay? Um, I think uh, dairy is pro-inflammatory, is why I tell you that. If you're gonna eat beef, love beef. Um, it's not the greatest for us, but there's arguments and studies on both sides that show that, you know, that beef isn't really as bad for you as people say it is. And in some people, certain type of blood types, it actually is probably better for you than not. Yeah. And I'm not an expert in that, but I read these things and I go, okay, so I think, you know, I just like to go down the middle, you know, get a little meat here, eat a little fish here, eat a little chicken here. Maybe somebody's not eat any type of animal protein and just stick to uh, plant-based proteins. You know, you can get enough protein out of a nice bowl of salad. Mm -hmm. People just don't really realize that a lot of vegetables have protein in them. Mm -hmm. And you'll probably only need about 15 grams of protein per meal to actually sustain muscle mass. And so I think that we, you know, as we're humans, we're always over-indulging and we're over, I guess, uh, exuberant in terms of the amount of nutrition we try to take in sometimes and I think because well more is better it's kind of like the premise of that but I, that's not always the healthiest thing to do so let's try to stick to organic stuff if you're gonna eat meats I think you eat um, you know beefs that are um, grass-fed mm -hmm. non-hormone non-antibiotic is naturally and the same probably the same farm so it's always the same line of type of meats that they're getting for you and I think the, that's the same thing for chickens and anything you want to eat like that and um, I think you change your diet frequently because different types of food present different types of nutrition for you. Mm -hmm. And no, and lots of water, lots of water, lots of water. Hydrate, mm -hmm. detoxify, sweat, exercise, do all the things that can get the toxins out of your body. And so that is a generalization approach to nutrition mm -hmm. uh, because I think if you do those things, you're in the right direction. Yeah. You know, and, and I think that um, I think that most people have just followed that. They probably do a lot better than possible. And notice, I didn't mention anything in the grain part, right? Mm-hmm. Okay. Because if you ever look at the food pyramid that we have, so kind of made for us by our nutrition society, we'll just say, mm -hmm. um, the pyramid focuses on a very small amount of fats on top, okay? But there's a lot of good fats in the like, you know, omega-3 fatty acids, omega-9 mm -hmm. fatty acids. You know, we need some of these things for good health. And at the very bottom, we have all this grain we talk about. And that grain is really what promotes obesity, hmm. diabetes, heart disease. So I'm not a big fan of that type of food because I don't think that we need... Because you can get a lot of carbohydrates out of vegetables mm -hmm. okay, and fruits. And to be honest, your body can make car sugars out of protein too, whatever you're eating. So the idea that you need it separately is not realistic. I think if you you know, want to replenish glucose stores in your muscles, that's a very hard strenuous workout. Sure, you want to have a little bowl of pasta, that's fine. But it's not like that's not that's not the emphasis of my diet. Uh, am I, you know, Argentinian and do we eat a lot of Italian food? Yeah, we do. But, you know, over time you've learned to moderate that because I want to decrease, and remember carbohydrates help promote inflammation, especially those refined ones and this, uh, this uh, acidity in your blood. So we, you, you want to be conscious of how much you put in that. So I don't put a lot of emphasis on carbs, um, except in the sense that you're going to get a lot out of fruits and vegetables if you're going to eat them. Um, there are some diets that are rich in fats, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. And so those diets have been popularized heavily because they really do help people lose weight. Okay. And they really do. But those particular diets are not good for everybody. And so there's a group of people that will do poorly on that in the sense that they may lose weight but it promotes a lot of inflammation in their body mm -hmm. and that can translate into a lot of hyperlipidemias cholesterols and things like that and people say well yeah okay there's cholesterol and cholesterol is bad for us and but especially if it's bad cholesterol but not all good cholesterol is good cholesterol not all bad cholesterol is bad cholesterol and so there's sub fractions of both that we're looking for balance in but I always tell people this, cholesterol is always at the scene of the crime, but it may not be the bandit. Ah, interesting. You know? And people, what does that mean? Well, because cholesterol can be there, but there's a lot of other things that have to happen, like inflammation mm -hmm. and oxidation 
and plaque formation. And so, uh, like I said, for some people, it's not the best idea for them. People will lose weight for sure. Um, because remember, I mean, in a sense, grain is not great for us. It's not good for us. Okay. And people who eat those high fat diets don't eat any grain. No white and no, no pale, no beige. It's all dark. Right? Mm -hmm. So in essence, you're not eating any of the things that we consider that are really bad for us, like bread, pasta, rice, tortillas, pastries, cakes. You know, and I always tell people fruit and juice because, and booze, and because uh -oh. because those are things that are really high in uh, sugars or carbohydrates to us. And so, if you avoid those things, then you don't create a hyperinsulinemic response. And insulin's not your friend. It's necessary, but it's not your friend. So, you want to keep insulin low. Okay. You keep insulin low. You're kind of lowering metabolism too a little bit too, but insulin promotes a lower a, a lower pH, which is acidity and inflammation. Mm -hmm. So it makes sense that you know that you want to not avoid those grains it's like that. But if you don't have insulin, you can't get any weight. So that's why people lose all this weight. So they're training their body to burn fats for energy, so they do lose weight. But again, some people are not going to do well because it promotes inflammation, and you need to be able to tell what patient that is. And in that case. There's only one diet that's been shown to be helpful in uh, preventing heart disease and death in people, and that's the Mediterranean diet. You know, mm. that's it. You know, um, but I would gather to think that the paleo diet and some DASH diets probably do a pretty good job too. Mm -hmm. But the literature really supports that it's only that type of diet, the Mediterranean style diet. So, and that's relatively low in bread, pasta, rice, tortillas, baked cakes, right? So, mm. um, I still think long term you're going to be looking to do that kind of diet. Short term, even if you had a lot of weight to use, you probably want to transition off one of those heavy fat diets after about eight months. Unless oh, you're extremely large. You know, but there's some, you know, famous docs out there that are very well read and a lot of literature on them and they've read some great books and you know, we don't have to mention them here, but they've got some really good books on those alternative high fat diets. And these are excellent clinicians, they write excellent information and excellent literature. But if you did an intermittent fast, you'd probably get a lot of the same results too. Interesting. Yeah, I read up on the the blood type diet because I have a not very common blood type. I'm A positive, and mm. we're supposed to be vegetarian, and isn't it blood type O is supposed to eat meat? I didn't know that, but it meets my friend, so now I know why. <laughs> like I said, I don't really focus too much on it. I just know that. I just figured because it was my genetics coming from Argentina, you know, being a mix of Italian and Spanish descent, that it kind of like is ingrained in me, but it's my blood type. <laughs> Let's talk about iatrophobia, which is, it's, it's one of the new buzzwords because there are <laughs> other terms for this, mm -hmm. but the most common term is white coat syndrome. Now, I had that when I first came in to see you. But did I wear a white coat? No, you didn't. There it is. But I still knew. <laughs> it's like a dog at the vet. They know where they are. The minute they get out of that car in the parking lot, they know where they are. And they're freaking out. I at one time had a Yorkshire Terrier, weighed six and a quarter pounds. He could drag me all over the vet's parking lot. You know. Um, what is it that makes us fear? Is I think when I was a child, getting shots or getting blood drawn, I learned to associate pain mm -hmm. with going to the doctor. And I was bitten by a dog one time, so Dad rushed me off to the doctor and I got a shot and I was not appreciative. And then there was another time I sprained my ankle and I had to go and get x-rays and I remember that hurt. So after a while I just came to associate you're going to the doctor, it's going to hurt. Yeah. And even as an adult, and a lot of people feel this way, uh, the blood pressure goes up. Yeah. Um, I have a friend that called me recently again. She saw one of our shows, and she says, you know, I really, really enjoyed that show. And she goes, I'm very informative. And she goes, I'm really thinking about going to see him. She says, uh, my doctor's concerned about my blood pressure because it's X over X whenever I go. And I said, but I'll bet it's kind of low normal. Otherwise, she says, yeah. I said, oh, yeah, that happens to me, too. What were your feelings when you were a child going to the doctor? I hated the doctor when I was a kid. Cause always, did I was, you? Yeah, I, I associated with getting a shot because we did get shots. Yeah. <laughs> they hated the doctor's office, but 
I, I think it's everybody's upbringing and their experience with doctors because ultimately your first experience is growing up is going to an office and getting needles stuck in you. Yeah. And um, maybe not having this, I don't know, as a child, having this really comforting relationship with somebody who's like examining you and touching you and then stick and then they're sticking needles in you and they say, okay, bye. And, you know, I think that people need to have a little, <laughs> okay, they need to have a little bit of a warm up, like <laughs> we deliver all this bad news. <laughs> yeah. And I think that's what most of it is for after doing this, because I've been doing this for 20 years and, um, and I see a lot of different types of patients and a lot of Latino patients and I, and we speak and speak in Spanish. And so, um, they tell me, how they're feeling and, and what they're because they haven't seen a doctor say in 10 15 years and i was asking well why because doctors always tell us bad news or they're afraid to hear to learn about what something might be wrong with them yeah and, and, and obviously some of these bad experiences that they've had in the past um and my response is like listen i i, I want to help you if you let me and so the way i know if what's going on is i have to do some tests and examine you but it doesn't have to be a bad visit even if there's stuff wrong with you, I'm pretty sure I can make it better if you just let me help you and if you try to cooperate with the plan. And it shouldn't necessarily have pain involved in it. And if, you know, because at the point where you're seeing adults now is um, they really don't need that many shots or vaccinations. Mm -hmm. But what they do need is to have an understanding of preventative medicine, mm -hmm. what we're trying to prevent. And so that would be the purpose of, see of seeing the doctor. Some people are afraid of the unknown because they don't want to know if anything's wrong with them. You know, in some cultures, they're just different in terms of what their expectations are. And if there's something really bad going on, you're really not supposed to tell them. You're supposed to tell the other family members, apparently, for some reason, in terms of so they know how to manage the situation. But some people don't want to know anything, what's wrong with them. And you have to respect that decision. It's obviously a little bit different because... In the United States, America, we like to give informed consent, right? We like to give informed disclosure so they know what we're talking about. And so they know exactly what is going on with them. But you have to, you know, you have to work with the wishes of the patient, always. But most patients, they don't like going to doctors because they don't want to hear bad news. They don't want to find out anything's bad with them, or wrong with them. They don't want to be on medications. Um, but they know something's wrong. And so why are you here then? Because, well, because my... My so-and-so who loves me told me I needed to come in. But you've really got to take your time to feel out the patient. It's all mostly about making them comfortable. But again, you keep, it, it, it is a very touchy-feely thing. It's an individualized treatment. And I think you have to be open to negotiating a little care. Yeah.